This lab has an entire set of Huawei IoT Core network and 5G base station devices, so we can run interoperability tests for IoT devices. OTA Lab offers signal distribution tests for 5G buses and optimizes their antenna signals to facilitate vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle collaboration. Fuzhou IoT Open Lab has a vertical application lab and Huawei Ecosystem Certification Lab among others, to provide a comprehensive test and commissioning environment. These open labs aggregate the innovative 5G services Huawei incubates at its global R&D centers, while also helping local ecosystem partners hatch and explore their own 5G services suitable for local markets. This cultivates a prosperous 5G industry ecosystem through openness and collaboration. From labs to smart buses to gas and water meters in your home, 5G networks are helping a wide range of industries. In the near future, a fully connected world will become a reality, and 5G will be there for everyone. Hello everyone, I am now at the Seagull Mine of Tiotia Iron and Steel Group in Jiaquan City, Kansu province. We are at the altitude of 3,400 meters and there is not a soul in sight. All kinds of mining trucks are going back and forth automatically. Automatic positioning, loading, unloading, transportation are all being carried out smoothly. Science fiction has just become a reality. So where are all the workers now? Let's go find out! From the merciless conditions of the mining site, the employees are sitting in a comfortable office looking like they're playing a mining game. This is the 5G Remote Control Center. Its large bandwidth, low latency and high reliability make remote intelligent control of the mobile equipment possible, enabling smooth operation of the whole mine. The implementation of 5G starting last year has essentially guaranteed employee safety. Instead of working in harsh, dangerous conditions, workers can now operate the equipment remotely. It eliminates safety risks, thereby achieving intelligent and efficient production. Wow, you are so nice. You can Chichen 5G remote control is a part of digital transformation of the mining industry. Seagull Mine is offering intelligent and information-based development of mining. The 5G Intelligent Control Center enables transparent production based on integrated networks. Management personnel can carry out monitoring and intelligent scheduling in real time, ensuring safe and efficient production. Inside this container is a 5G H data center. A box-shaped cabinet where temperature and moisture are controlled contains DIMS ICT equipment. It has helped to crack the problem of installing and deploying equipment in traditional mines. Massive amounts of data generated by 5G technologies is processed here. This is the digital center of Seagull Mines Smart Digital Transformation with an exciting experience in an unmanned mining area. Let's see what direct way of a single mine of a Tiotia Iron and Steel Group and communications uh, equipment that and services.
When the distance between us Tracing the sky like city windows I watch you reflect in your eyes Fog and torn the New York City high-rise You and me on I am Neil Bush, founder and chairman of the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations, and I am honored to be invited to speak at this, the Trust in Tech Summit. Thank you to all those who made this event possible. The message you will hear at this year's summit is that for the entire global community to innovate and prosper together, we must build out channels of trust and find areas of global collaboration. These are common goals we share. Goals that reflect the lifelong vision that my father, President George H.W. Bush, had for the United States and China. He believed that not only was the U.S.-China relationship the most consequential bilateral relationship in the world, but also that a constructive relationship between our two countries serves the vital interests of the United States, China, and all nations. I first visited China in 1975 when my father was the chief liaison officer representing the United States in Beijing. Since then, I've traveled to China over 140 times, visited over 40 cities, and have had a front row seat in witnessing China's rise. In 1975, it was impossible to imagine China becoming the second largest economy in the world by 2020. After the doors to China were open, after people were given the freedom to choose where to live and work, after economic incentives were put in place from one five-year plan to the next, China has risen, lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. As a freedom-loving American, it has been remarkable to witness this transformation during my lifetime. And I'm proud of America's role in improving the quality of life for so many fellow citizens. Ironically, it is the very fact of China's rise that is causing consternation globally. It is the very fact of China's rise that there are suspicions regarding China's objectives. American values make it imperative that we shout out concerns regarding human rights, that we hold others to high standards of conduct, including protection of intellectual property, that we make the case for transparency, for equal access to markets, and for leveling the global playing field. Many are embracing a dangerous zero-sum mentality that defies common sense. China's success does not take away from ours, and vice versa. It would be crazy to decouple. The United States, China, and other countries that are advancing communications technologies, for example, ought to be working together to ensure cross-border compatibility with devices and networks. The easier it is to communicate, the better the world will be. And if either side has suspicion that the networks or devices are compromised, then do what U.S. President Ronald Reagan advocated with the Russians many years ago, trust but verify. Communication is critically important for peaceful development and shared prosperity. Misunderstandings and conflict arise out of a lack of clear communications. We must demand more substantive communications in person or via Zoom, events that increase all levels and sectors of government-to-government -government interaction that see more business to business and people to people dialogue. When people sit and get to know one another, the barriers that create a lack of trust come down and the opportunities for avoiding conflict and for cooperation dramatically increase. 
as we have seen particularly in the area of technology when China and the United States collaborate we can innovate in foundational and revolutionary ways from smart cities to supercomputing both countries dedication to educating and advancing the next generation of science and technology will have a profound impact on our world though we have different cultures political systems and often starkly different points of view we have a mutual vision for a world where we jointly help lift people out of poverty give people better access to education health care and foster a robust global economy we have to lock arms to help one another reduce carbon emissions we must find our common humanity to address the tremendous challenges to sustaining life on earth for a growing population we can achieve all these goals through better communications and developments in technologies. Though we are witnessing a low water mark in bilateral political relations, we must forge on. I am optimistic in part because technologies developed by Huawei, AT&T, Nippon, and other communications giants are bringing people from all over the world closer together. Younger generations will feel connected and informed in ways that will help them bypass political posturing to address the most pressing problems challenging sustained life on Earth. Our work at the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations is guided by a mantra that virtually no major global challenge today can be resolved in any enduring sense in the absence of effective communication and cooperation between the United States and China. In that spirit, I wish you all a successful and informative Trust in Tech Summit and encourage each of you to look for new and innovative ways to build the trust we need to achieve our common global goals. Thank you. Like most of my friends and colleagues participating in this year's Trust in Tech Summit, I've spent quite a bit of time since uh, 20 months thinking, working, listening, and discussing about how a post-COVID world would look like, if and when there has to be one, which we all hope. What I want uh, to do today is share with you my answer to this question and how I believe trust in tech can help address the consequences of what I see now unfortunately, as a more divided world than in the past decades. The theme of the Paris Peace Forum, which just took place mid-November and which I have the privilege to chair, was Mind the Gaps. Global gaps in this world are getting wider, not just because of Covid. What then is the role? of tech in bridging these global gaps. That global gaps are getting wider is pretty clear. If you look at the main global trend, let me take three examples, climate, digitalization and uh, geopolitics. Starting with economics, the economic divide between North and South, between rich and emerging countries on the one side and poorer ones on the other is increasing. For the first time in 50 years, the Covid crisis will have interrupted the slow long-term convergence in growth rates between rich and poor countries on this planet. More poverty, more suffering, hence more social and political tensions. A new climate divide is also appearing, not just because of the disproportionate impact of global warming on some weak countries, but also because of the heterogeneity of mitigation and adaptation national strategies and measures. Time horizons for zero net carbon are different, ranging from 2050 to 2070, for countries who have such a time horizon, carbon peaks take place at different periods. Policy tools such as taxation, emission trading systems, regulation, various incentives are different 
and this will likely result in a more unlevel playing field for international trade. COVID has also accelerated the digitalization of our economic and social systems. Digital capacity gaps are widening among countries as well as inside many of our populations where the skills and production systems will have to be profoundly reshaped, transformed with uh, the likely ensuing turbulence. As if this was not enough, uh, geopolitics are adding their own toll on these worrying trends. Whatever the reason for this evolution, and both sides have their own interpretation about that, the US and China are now engaged in many areas in a more intense rivalry than in the past, thus raising the level of stress on the rest of the world. Decoupling or dual circulation are now becoming fashionable on both sides, with more search for self-reliance, at least in sectors of productions of goods and services deemed critical for security or strategic reasons. The EU has also started to think in similar terms, although so far less aggressively. All in all, some new kind of fragmentation is underway that will impact the economies of the rest of the world. If I look back through my nearly 40 years of engagement in international economics, my sad feeling is that this world has recently changed course. From previous dynamics when geoeconomics who tend to integrate, superseded geopolitics who tend to divide, to a different balance where geopolitics now supersede geoeconomics one in which the zero-sum games of power games have become more than the positive-sum game of cooperation. When I had to pass my hearing at the European Parliament many years ago in 1999 to become EU Trade Commissioner, my vision was that we needed to harness globalization in order to make this world a better place. Today, some 20 years later, I would probably take a different stance. I would say that we need to mitigate deglobalization in order to avoid making this world a worse place. And this is where tech and trust in tech comes in big way. I think that tech, the digital tech in the front line, can be a formidable tool to bridge these global gaps, but I also believe this tool needs to be properly governed on a global scale to avoid further divisions. That digital tech is key to addressing some of the major challenges I just mentioned seems quite obvious. Take the environment challenges uh, with, for instance, the ocean and the hydrosphere, whether an area for decarbonization or as a carbon sink or as an ecosystem needing serious regeneration of biodiversity. We know we still have a big science gap about the ocean. Building a digital twin of the ocean can help improve uh, oceanographic science much faster than with conventional means. It's about collecting much more data with much more precision from both space observations and water systems, and then powering new simulation systems with artificial uh, intelligence. Take education and professional training, which in my own experience is the number one issue if we really want to reduce social and economic inequalities. More affordable, more accessible digital devices enhance interactions and learning. They allow individual tailor-made upskilling programs and also cultural exchanges, dialogues, and knowledge, including of how and why others differ. For all these reasons, tech, and in particular digitalization, is the way to go to avoid a growing fragmentation, which I see coming in the future. But for tech to be the solution, uh, let's make sure it doesn't contribute to the problem as the use of digital technology can also be a new source of divisions. 
Why? Because of this new complex digital nexus between technology, security and ideology, which has appeared in the new non-material part of the economy, while artifacts are usually ideologically neutral, politically neutral, I mean a car is a car everywhere on this planet, data systems are not neutral. It's also different in the digital area with cyber penetration as a much higher threat in the new economy than in the old one. There are some of the reasons why data collection, accessibility, storage, privacy, cross-border circulation are regulated differently in different places. Thus, progressively, creating a much more unlevel playing field with its inevitable loss of economies of scale and hence loss of efficiencies and hence loss of welfare potential. A sort of digital non-globalization in the making. And this is why I believe we need to seriously consider how to shape the global governance of our digital ecosystems and how to frame local regulations in a way that keeps as much openness as possible to the benefit of a free international exchange. While areas like accessibility or privacy will inevitably, in my view, lead to divergences, let's try and keep the necessary interoperability in order to organize coexistence. On the other end of the spectrum, where convergence is still possible, such as on the security or the resilience of critical digital infrastructures, let's try and keep convergence as the guiding strategic concept. In the case of digital trade, a global frame is being negotiated at the WTO. It's about finding the necessary balance between coexistence and convergence to address these new challenges of digital trade interdependencies. I remember from my time when I was DG of the World Trade Organization how the ITA, the International Technology Agreement, has worked, including in providing easier access to technology for many poorer countries. It is also about allowing connected global supply chains to do what they can do best, distribute technology as efficiently and as quickly as possible to as many people as possible. In a nutshell, uh, and to uh, conclude, uh, let me uh, share with you uh, my conviction. Growing gaps in this world are dangerous. The right response uh, is to try and bridge them. Tech has to be one of the archers of these bridges we need to build collectively. Let's work hard uh, to build more reciprocal trust in tech and to find the necessary compromises uh, between our systems, knowing that this will imply trade-offs, give and take, where possible. This is the very purpose of the various uh, digital initiatives, which we have been nurturing at the Paris Peace Forum since uh, 2018. More to come uh, in the future. Many uh, thanks for your attention. Good afternoon. My name is William Nordhaus. I'm a professor at Yale University. What I'd like to talk to you about today is new approaches for cooperation to slow global warming. The four topics I'd like to mention today are these. First, there's been very slow progress in climate policy. Secondly, the main issue from an economic point of view is, is that carbon prices or emission prices are much too low. A third point is the inadequate investment in carbon technolo low carbon technologies. And finally, and most important, that free riding has been undermining climate agreements around the world. We'll start with the climate policies and their ineffectiveness. This graph shows the trends in what is known as decarbonization around the world. This is the world carbon output ratio over time from 1990 to 2019. And what this shows is that the rate of decarbonization or the carbon output ratio, the CO2 emissions output ratio, 
has been, dec been declining steadily at a little under 2% per year. But the most interesting thing about this is that there's been no change in this in recent years, where the trend in carbonization or decarbonization is roughly unchanged. So what this suggests is that the carbon policies that we've devised, both as nations and internationally, have not been effective in bending down the curve as much as we would need to reach our aspirations and the international agreements that we've reached. So this is the world excluding China. Let me show you the Chinese situation. China is, of course, the world's largest emitter, but it also has been declining much more sharply, whereas the rest of the world has been declining at about 2% a year in its carbon ratio and its CO2 emissions to output ratio. China has been declining at almost 4% a year. And the other interesting thing about China is that in the last few years, since, since 2012, the ratio has been declining at almost 6% a year. So China is decarbonizing faster, but it also has further to go. This graph shows you the emissions of CO2 equivalent, the carbon dioxide equivalent. That's carbon dioxide and other gases like methane. And it shows you on the far left the history in the first two uh, dots, and then the projections under different scenarios. And as you can see, with current policies, emissions would continue to rise over time by maybe 15 billion tons a year by 2070. And on that trajectory, we would have also global temperatures rise, continue to rise sharply. So the basic idea I'd like to get across here is we're making progress, but not sufficient to meet our targets. Now, the next point I'd like to emphasize is the role of carbon pricing. The main contribution of economics to climate change and climate change policy is to emphasize the importance of pricing the emissions of carbon dioxide and other gases. Put differently, it's that a high price on these emissions is the key to sharp emissions reductions. The reason is pretty straightforward. As emissions, as the price of the emissions rise, then companies will change their technologies, say from burning coal to renewables, or from driving gasoline-powered cars to electric cars, or perhaps reducing their activities in high emission CO2, or high carbon technologies and high carbon sectors. So that's the absolute key to sharp emissions reductions. This carbon emission price should ideally be the same in different countries and different sectors. It shouldn't be high in one sector and low in another, or high in one country and low in another. And what we found is in much history of regulation, not just in energy, but in other areas, that fiscal approaches such as taxes or prices on emissions are much more efficient and much more effective than regulatory approaches that say, do this or don't do that. Now, I would say, but, if we look at the landscape of carbon pricing, what we find is in fact, carbon prices are highly fragmented around the world. And they're also very low. So whereas the target price might be in the range of 50 or $100 a ton to meet our objectives, the average carbon price in 2020, according to the World Bank, was about $3 a ton of CO2. So if we were to meet our objectives, our temperature objectives, or perhaps not quite such, so ambitious an objective, maybe instead of two degrees or two and a half degrees, or even three degrees, we would need very high carbon prices relative to what we have now. We would need a minimum of $50 a ton of carbon price, of emissions price, and we might need as much as $150 a ton to meet the most strict targets. But we're not there yet, we're not even close. The third point is the importance of technologies and in investments in low carbon technologies. So just to back up a little, one of the interesting and important points about innovation 
is that there is a big gap between the public return to innovation and innovative activities, research and development, and the private return. So even though private inventors and private firms that do research and development may earn profits, the public return on that is much greater. And if we see this, we can look, for example, at the returns in terms of health and safety and economics to the vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines, which are very great. The World Bank has estimated that the vaccines are saving us in the order of $500 billion a month. But the returns to the inventors, the firms that did these vaccines, is only a fraction of that, maybe 10% of that, maybe 5% of that. And that's a pervasive fact across all forms of innovation, whether it's pharmaceuticals or computers or chemicals or different areas. But the fact is, this is even worse for environmental goods and services because there's what we call a double externality for low carbon innovations. Because not only you have this gap that you normally have for innovation, but you also have the benefits of low carbon innovation are underpriced because of the low price on carbon dioxide emissions. But in addition, we need special incentives for low carbon technologies. We need special incentives that reflect the fact that this is a particular priority. One of the ways to meet these is through public funding of research and development. And all governments do public funding of research and development in different areas in health, in energy, in military, and in many other areas. But what we see, if we look for the United States, I'm not showing other countries here, but just for the United States, is a very, very distorted set of priorities relative to the need for carbon technologies. And this shows that um, US federal research and development fundings for 2020 billions of dollars and it may be a little hard to read but as you can see the line on the left is the total uh, in the hundreds of 150 billion dollars and then the three big ones big areas uh, are military and health and then the other but if you look at that little tiny bar on the right is the federal funding for low carbon technologies for renewable technologies and for um, fundamental research in energy. It's about $2 billion a year. And so what you can see here is an example of very badly distorted priorities, even though the president and other political leaders have said that it's a very high priority to improve technologies. We're not putting our research and development dollars into that. And so this needs to be a big improvement, not just in the United States, now, the final topic I want to uh, mention today is the role of international policy. Now, we've, we've just finished the uh, conference of the party in Glasgow. It was the 26th conference of the party, which go back almost 30 years. But the fact is, when we look at this, international policy is really at a dead end. Climate change and the way is uh, happening is being hampered international climate policy is being hampered by what's known as free riding. And in this area, unlike many other areas, the international agreements are all voluntary. So countries can agree to them if they want to, and they can ignore them if they want to. Uh, and this is really a penalty. It's, it, it's uh, because they're voluntary and there are no penalties for non-participation. Now, we have thought uh, at Yale here and around different areas about using different policies to overcome free riding. And what effective policies require is uh, new incentives that I call a climate club, that they have both carrots and sticks. And so a climate club, as we've th thought of it, would involve a regime with two features. One would, going back to what we talked about earlier, one feature would be that it has a target carbon price, perhaps $50 per ton of CO2 emissions, that all countries who are participants in the club must meet. 
but it also has penalties on those who are not participants or who fail to meet their objectives. And it might be something like a 3% penalty tariff on the imports from the non-club into the club region. So let me, uh, let me just review then for you what, what we've had today and to put a little bit in perspective as we go along. The first point I want to emphasize is how little progress we've made to date on slowing warming. We've made very little progress in terms of bending down the curve of emissions. It's been declining in the globe roughly at 2% a year, but it needs to decline. It's been sorry, declining at about 2% a year, but we need it to decline much more sharply if we're going to meet our objectives, at least 4 and up to 6% a year. So we need to have much more rapid decarbonization if we're going to reach our international agreements. Now, one way to meet that, and economists emphasize one of the most effective ways, is through high and harmonized carbon prices, or high and harmonized prices on CO2 emissions, or more generally, on the emissions of greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, and other harmful chemicals. And that will allow us to tilt our economy, to tilt the playing field away from using these greenhouse gases, away from climate change toward slowing climate change. A third point I've emphasized is the importance of low carbon technologies in meeting our objectives. The fact is that if we're going to meet our objectives, we're going to have to roll over a very substantial part of our energy infrastructure. And it also requires new technologies to meet those that we're going to have to, we're going to, have to invent, we're going to have to innovate, we're going to have to develop, we're going to have to commercialize, and we're going to have to make them very large scale. The final point on the international agreements is to recognize that the current approaches to international climate policy are a dead end. They're a dead end because they are voluntary. And so countries who benefit will join them, and countries for whom they're costly can drop out. We need a plan in which there are incentives, carrots and sticks, for countries to join the climate club. And this would, we call this a climate club because it is something where you set an effective policy, such as a carbon price floor for all countries, but you combine that with incentives for countries to join, say through tariffs for those who are not compliant. So that's a summary of what the current state of international agreements and climate policy looks like from the status of economics and the social sciences and the policy sciences, also from the point of view of what we need to do. So I hope you enjoy the conference. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, uh, but that's, uh, that's it for today. Thank you and goodbye. Dear friends, hello. Welcome to the Trust in Tech Conference 2021. Today, the topic of my speech is technological innovation for a low-carbon intelligent society. The world has reached broad consensus on carbon neutrality. With more than 140 countries and regions announcing carbon neutrality targets, in the next 30 to 40 years, there will be two certain trends. The first is intelligence, and the second is low-carbon development. Let's start with intelligence. Intelligence is accelerating, and it has implications to every person, home, organization, and even the entire society. For example, smartphones, smart manufacturing, smart home, and autonomous driving are already around us. More intelligent scenarios will emerge continuously in the future. Next, on low carbon development. As the world enters the era of carbon neutrality, the low carbon targets, in the context of the energy sector, means clean power generation, electrification of energy utilization, and intelligent scheduling of the grid. By constructing a novel new energy power system, traditional fossil fuels will be gradually replaced, 
thus starting the process of all-round decarbonization of humankind from the very source. Intelligence requires digital technologies. Low-carbon development depends on power electronics technologies. The global energy sector is moving from resource-dependent to technology-driven. Fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas are limited and cannot support sustainable development and are the source of extreme climate and environmental pollution. However, clean energy driven by technology is navigating humankind out of difficulties and would also bring new momentum to world economic growth and sustainable development. To better help customers achieve the goal of carbon neutrality, Huawei Digital Power Company is committed to integrating digital and power electronics technologies, developing clean energy and energy digitalization, and continuously carrying out converged innovations around clean power generation, energy digitalization, green ICT infrastructure, transportation electrification, and integrated smart energy. We are ready to work with global customers and partners to build low-carbon homes, buildings, factories, campuses, villages, and cities, and support the shift from low-carbon society to zero-carbon society. The world energy sector is going digital. Digital technologies are enabling energy to become more intelligent. By integrating digital and power electronics technologies, information flow and energy flow, we use bit to manage what and realize digital sensing, control, and management of the energy system. In the future, we will continue innovating and carrying out in-depth applications in the following aspects. First, in the area of clean power generation, we will promote the building of a novel, new energy power system so that every ray of sunlight can be converted into more clean power. In Qinghai Province, China, we helped Huanghe Hydropower Development Company to build the world's largest renewable energy base consisting of wind, PV, and hydropower. UHV power lines are adopted to transmit clean power to hundreds of thousands of homes across thousands of kilometers. The 2.2 gigawatt PV campus is one typical project, which produces nearly 5 billion kilowatt hour of clean power each year. This project covers a total area of 56 square kilometers and has more than 5 million PV modules. Through a series of intelligent and digital technologies, each PV module is precisely managed. This improves the total power generation by over 2% and the maintenance efficiency by over 50% realizing lower LCOE. This project also greatly improved the local ecosystem, with power generated through the PV modules and the sheep grazing underneath. Desert has been turned into oasis. There is green grass under clear sky, where cows and sheep can be seen when the wind blows and the grass lowers. Second, in energy digitalization, we will build a twin system of the digital world and the energy world. Digital technologies such as cloud and AI will enable traditional energy production, transmission, transaction, and consumption, realizing energy and resource digitalization and improving energy production and utilization efficiency. Third, the transportation sector accounts for 21% of global carbon emissions. Promoting transportation electrification is an important part of achieving carbon neutrality. Through digital technologies, we redefine the driving and the riding experience and the safety of electric vehicles, surpassing internal combustion vehicles in terms of ultimate acceleration, stability, and safety. For example, a 200-kilometer range can be achieved within 10 minutes of charging, which helps improve the range and the charging experience of new energy vehicles, increase range per kilowatt hour of power, and accelerate the popularization of electric vehicles. Fourth, with the acceleration of intelligence, 
humankind is witnessing exponential growth of data. ICT infrastructure is the foundation of the digital world. Currently, the global ICT industry consumes 2% of the total power, which will increase to 4% in the future. In terms of green ICT infrastructure, we build green and low-carbon data centers and communications networks, enabling more computing power and connections per watt, and enabling ICT infrastructure to become an engine for green and a low-carbon digital economy. Fifth, cities are embracing low-carbon transformation at higher speed. We focus on low-carbon campuses and buildings. Through integrated smart energy solution, we will integrate source, grid, load, and storage to build low-carbon buildings and campuses, reducing energy consumption costs and improving energy efficiency. In Futan District, Shenzhen, the Antoshan campus of Huawei Digital Power Company under construction will be built into the world's largest PEDF campus with net zero carbon footprint. The campus is expected to be put into use in 2022. When built, the campus generates 1.5 million kilowatt hour of clean power PV annually, and the annual power consumption will drop from over 14 million kilowatt hour to 7 million kilowatt hour, saving over 50% of power and reducing carbon emissions by over 60%. By September 30, 2021, Huawei Digital Power Business has helped customers generate 443.5 billion kilowatt hour of green power and saved 13.6 billion kilowatt hour, which is equivalent to 210 million tons less carbon emissions and the planting of 290 million trees. Over 30 years ago, we deployed telephones to every home, enriching people's communication and life. More than 10 years ago, we deployed networks to connect every corner and build a fully connected world. Today and in the future, we are committed to bridging the energy divide and providing stable, clean energy for everyone. Friends, the magnificent undertaking for carbon neutrality is unfolding. Let us join hands with upstream and downstream industries, governments, industry organizations, standards organizations and partners for coordinated innovations and contribute to energy innovation and the sustainable development of the world. Let us align thoughts and pull wisdom to jointly promote the energy revolution featuring low carbon, electrification and intelligence. Build a low carbon smart society and share a green and a better future. Thank you. Healthcare is often said to be old-fashioned and resistant to change. I don't believe it is. It is, however, resistant to change without clear, measurable and realisable benefit and is a powerhouse of innovation. The World Health Organization reports that global health spend was 8.3 trillion US dollars in 2020, or approximately 10% of world GDP pre-pandemic. So health represents a huge potential market. COVID has a huge tale of consequence, both in financial terms, but also of delayed care. Increases the number of elderly with high healthcare demand, and in many countries, significantly challenging the available capacity. There are not enough trained doctors and nurses across the world with capacity to meet the current, let alone future demand. Training more takes many, many years. The fact is that we are facing a shortage of capacity and tech support is essential to increase their effectiveness. The COVID pandemic has challenged healthcare across the world and most countries and systems are now struggling to catch up with care that was deferred during the crisis. There are many models of healthcare provision across the world some of which have benefit from the patient staying healthy and others of them getting sick. 
politically funded and insurance-based systems have an event horizon that is often measured in a small number of years, as opposed to the decades that may be needed to reap the benefit. For example, improving the management of a teenage diabetic will reap benefit in the terms of reduced complications some three to four decades later, increasing working life contribution to healthcare costs, but may also increase life expectancy and healthcare needs in the long term. Working out who pays for change and who benefits is not always easy, but must be understood. Focus on real benefit delivery will be rewarded with success. So let's see what digital transformation can bring to the industry. Let us consider data. The most effective medical record holds detail of all examinations, treatments, interventions and investigations from birth and throughout life while ensuring any part is rapidly accessible and perhaps predicting what will be of most value to the user. So who owns the data within the medical record and where is it held? There are a variety of legal and other constraints which vary across the world and need to be navigated. Europe regards medical data as highly sensitive and has perhaps the tightest restrictions around its storage and access. The clinician needs the right information in the right place at the right time. It is also vitally important that it is clear whether all the information is available or what is missing. This is compounded by many tech providers wanting to hold and manage data they are generating or need to work. This leads to fragmentation of the record and the further potential that information is not up to date. This is a common issue with many tech implementations, where different medical records are held in different supplier systems. A proposed solution is that everything is held across a single healthcare system, is provided an interface from a single supplier. The reality is that not even the IT giants, Microsoft, Google, etc., are able to deliver such global integration and it could stifle implementation of innovation and improvement. Suppliers will be successful when they learn to release and share data in a secure and effective way with others. The data held also need to cope with evolution of operating and display systems and not become out of date. By contrast, paper has not evolved much in the last millennia. Past lessons have yet to be learned. So for example, the 3M capital hit failures were hugely challenging to track down and resolve. 3M only held incomplete records. The current concerns about mesh implants from a variety of companies is ongoing and challenged by lack of accessible records. Properly structured records would alleviate these issues. There are many other challenges in healthcare provision where very large amounts of data need to be moved, for example, high resolution 3D scans and shared in an environment which is tech unfriendly, for example, water, other fluids and cleaning requirements and can be faced with multiple Faraday cages and resultant poor networks. It is also important to engage with context. We can measure many physiological variables with wearable tech, which may, for example, log blood sugar levels. The value of data in isolation is much less than within context. For example, when last insulin was taken, the nature of that insulin mixture and the relationship to food, exercise, sleeping, etc. Tech solutions need to enable the capture of a broad range of contextual data. The commercial world needs to engage with and better understand the benefits of a different approach to data sharing and management. Medicine has shown how rapid progress can be made by sharing data freely and without restriction in the world response to the COVID pandemic. This has crossed and ignored commercial and geopolitical boundaries. And this approach needs to be taken as core to how we approach data for the future, for the benefit of all. So what of the future? The only certainty is that it is impossible to predict with certainty. However, there are perhaps areas that are more worthy of attention. 
Genetic susceptibility is already gaining attention and I will not explore this further here. Screening may be very amenable to future tech and provided screening costs are low, an effective avoidance of major healthcare demands or early preventative intervention delivered, then benefits are likely to be very real. Ultrasound screening for abdominal aortic aneurysm, enabling elective, potentially minimally invasive intervention, is an example of such a process. Screening by smell is one example which needs attention. Dogs have demonstrated that they can detect a variety of cancers and Parkinson's disease long before they would normally be identified clinically. Tech is ready to go mobile, wearable, and able to integrate data sources to provide context and increase the value. Taking the information to the individual rather than having to find a workstation and log in just of itself saves a huge amount of clinician time. AI can help with the sorting and sieving of data to maximise the performance of healthcare professionals, for example, drug screening for new treatments. There is much potential innovation in medicine, which can, if supported by the right tech with the right approach, benefit patients, healthcare providers and tech providers in the short, medium and longer term. It is not something we could see it is something we must embrace if we are going to meet the demand for healthcare worldwide. It should be a win for all. I hope that this short discussion of my thoughts around trust in tech has suggested that there is great potential for delivering benefit by implementing tech in healthcare and perhaps where some of the pitfalls may be avoided. Let's all learn to work and live together share data openly and enthusiastically and make this world a better place. I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and thank you for this opportunity to participate in the summit. My presentation today briefly examines a topic that is of importance to all of us who work across international and cultural boundaries in our effort to understand the world in which we live. My message is simple, yet compelling and imperative. Science works best when principles of diversity, partnership, and international cooperation become as essential as the funding we all depend on. Across the planet, there are numerous examples of international cooperation in large science projects. Those that most of us are familiar with tackle some of the biggest questions and problems. For example, the International Brain Initiative. Seven countries, including China, Canada, the United States, Australia, Japan, Korea, and Europe, have a role to advance neuroscience across many disciplines. 30 Meter Telescope is a partnership of Canada, China, India, Japan, and the United States. They all work together to build what will become the next largest optical telescope. Once completed, it will be three times the size of the current largest optical telescope in operation, the twin 10 meter Keck telescopes at Mauna Kea in Hawaii. The Long Baseline Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory the United States, United Kingdom, Germany, and Australia work together with other international partners to confirm Einstein's ideas of the structure of the universe. The European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN, operates the Large Hadron Collider. 23 member European states have built the Large Hadron Collider, and 18 different countries take part in various experiments identifying what makes up the matter of the universe. All of these are prime examples of international cooperation where diverse teams collaborate to answer compelling questions. But what is it about international collaborations and team diversity that generates successful results beyond individuals working independently? How does diversity bring benefit to science? In his 2014 Scientific American Voices article, 
Kenneth Gibbs Jr. states that while the current paradigm still promotes the notion of the lone, brilliant individual, when we consider scientific research as a group problem solving, instead of the unveiling of individual brilliance, diversity becomes key to excellence. In fact, National Institutes of Health Director Francis Collins has said chronic and woeful underrepresentation in the workforce leads to the inescapable conclusion that we are missing critical contributors to our talent pool. So what does the future of international cooperation in science look like? International cooperation in science must demonstrate and value diversity as a means of engaging the best talent for problem solving. International education exchange programs and the inevitability of social media's role in shrinking and shaping the world also foster the addition of new voices adding diversity via international team participation. International cooperation in science must have as an imperative finding solutions to the global threats to a sustainable environment and human existence. After all, we are not all escaping to Mars on rockets to set up Earth 2.0. Even the chilliest periods of the Cold War, United States scientists maintained ties with their counterparts in the Soviet Union, and these relationships were of substantial value in promoting the transition to warmer relations. Two recent examples where science collaboration superseded international political tensions are the 30-year collaboration between the Russian space agency Roscosmos and the United States space agency NASA in the construction and operation of International Space Station and collaboration on COVID-19 research between Chinese and world scientists to quickly and accurately sequence the DNA of the virus. Now, what are the primary areas of research that will benefit from international cooperation? Let's start with space exploration and astronomy. The most difficult challenges in the human exploration of the near solar system will require the diverse experiences, knowledge bases, and combined resources to reach and safely return from planetary exploration. While NASA and other national space agencies have been successful in exploring the near side of the moon or have orbiters collecting data, only the Chinese National Space Agency has successfully landed and operated a rover on the far side of the moon, filling a very important gap in our knowledge base about the moon. Clearly an example of how cooperation could be beneficial to all lunar explorers. If the next stop for human exploration of the solar system is Mars, doesn't it make sense that the collective knowledge and resources of humankind be brought to bear on solving the challenges of human space exploration? As for astronomy, the biggest questions we ask about the universe are pointing us more and more towards understanding the smallest interaction at the quantum level. The Tianyan Fast Radio Telescope and the Large Hadron Collider at CERN represent cutting-edge instruments whose effective use require the diversity of thought, approach, and experience found through international teams and cooperation to justify their enormous expense. Unfortunately, it's now becoming painfully obvious that emergent environmental issues such as climate change, global warming, alternative energy sources, waste management, and food security affect us all via the Earth's interconnected ecosystems. What any one of us does in the environment not only affects us all, but has the potential to produce unintended negative interactions that may exacerbate a previous condition thus compounding the problem. We must all coordinate and synchronize our efforts to avoid what could become an irreversible ecological disaster. In the realm of biomedical studies, the vision of the International Brain Initiative is to catalyze and advance ethical neuroscience through international collaboration and knowledge sharing says Amy Bernard of the International Brain Initiative Inventory Working Group, 
The hope is that the kind of work and the kind of effort that can be leveraged by a global community is going to be more powerful and more impactful than any of the individual groups on their own. All the better to understand brain function and improve illness treatment protocols. And one I find particularly compelling, eliminating genetic diseases. To unlock the roots of genetic disease, one of the Human Genomes Project's goal is to use the complete human genome sequence to improve our ability to diagnose and treat genetic diseases that affect millions worldwide every day. Imagine being able to eliminate the most debilitating diseases through the ethical and responsible manipulation of DNA at the genetic level. Now this is just a small sample of the kind of science challenges and opportunities that can benefit from international collaboration and cooperation. But as we know, there are challenges to international collaboration and cooperation. So what are some of those challenges? First, we have to say that they must be acknowledged in order to be resolved. Now, according to a study of 1,286 academics by the Royal Society published in 2019, some of the primary barriers to international collaboration are geopolitical tensions. In fact, Chinese collaboration with U.S. authors has been waning since 2017. Not good. But fortunately, in many instances, science has been able to transcend political and ideological differences allowing the development of collaborative networks that bring enormous talent to work on research. According to Ann Hatch at the San Francisco Declaration Research Assessment, many of the structures and mechanisms that evaluate and reward science are still those of the age of the lone scientist. There are few awards for collective performance of teams and collaborations. Even though there is little formal recognition among science awards for group work, science flourishes best in a climate of mutually respectful international partnership and collaboration. Funding for science research is more readily available when the work proposed is built around international teams making use of the best talent and the application of the results is more widely distributed through products or processes where the public can make use of the innovations. In conclusion, in our world today, the challenges are more complex and their solutions more elusive. Research team diversity and partnership, international cooperation and collaboration are essential in the continual effort to improve the quality of life for everyone. As I said in my introduction, science works best when principles of diversity, partnership, and international cooperation become as essential as the funding we all depend on. Here's one way we can all work together to advance the work we know is important. Foster and support diversity, international collaboration, and cooperation. Our world depends on it. Fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen, on the onset, let me be the first one to thank Huawei for having the ASEAN Secretariat in this Trust in Tech Summit 2021. In fact, the overall team of the event, Rebuild, Reunite, Reset, is indeed very highly relevant to the ASEAN fraternity and the wider global community as we all are recovering from the pandemic. The team is actually in line with the outcome of the recently concluded 26th uh, UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow that sought to put into place measures to aggressively cut greenhouse gases emissions and slow the Earth's warming. Our efforts to address the present COVID-19 pandemic challenges and the regeneration of our economies definitely have to meet. We all need to take into consideration of the future sustainability obligations and the commitments. 
For this, I believe the private sector led discussion today is very encouraging because private sector plays the leading facilitating role in promoting global economic recovery. And in this regard, I'd like to thank all the private sector representatives here uh, for their active participation and engagement in advancing inclusive and sustainable economic recovery for our region and beyond. Now, against these backgrounds, allow me to complement what have been presented earlier and kind of share my thoughts specifically on the roles of digitalization and the collaboration that we can play in advancing economic recovery and this focus on sustainability. Allow me to start by sharing with you briefly the ASEAN economic outlook first. While it's projected to be the fourth largest economy by 2030, the COVID-19 pandemic has definitely disrupted our region's economic growth trajectory. In fact, uh, this past year, ASEAN has seen our economy decline in 2019 by 3.3% as a result of disruptions of value chains and a drop in consumption and general business activities. Likewise, our ASEAN total trade value have also declined 5.5% in 2020. Uh, it stood at US 2.7 trillion uh, compared to 2.8 trillion the year before. But I think despite this, we kind of are noticing that there's an increase in the demand for key new products, especially those that are needed for the production of medical supplies, such as rubber and bathing materials, and of course, technology. Now, uncertainties have also dampened the investor sentiments. As we saw our FDI inflowing in ASEAN, it fell by 24.6% in 2020 to about USD 137.3 billion. Though I must say that the region ASEAN still continues to be one of the most attractive investment destinations for FDI. In fact, we are absorbing close to about 13.7% of global FDI flows. As our economy slowly reopens, the ASEAN GDP is expected to recover this year. And we are expecting a rate of anywhere between 3 to 3.1%. And for next year, the economies are projecting that ASEAN is going to grow even stronger to about 5%. While I'm generally optimistic with the prospect of the economic recovery in our region, we definitely have to be very cautiously mindful of the various uncertainties that are disrupting our path to recovery. For all we know that the next crisis may be around the corner and we all need to be fully prepared to face such unpredictable calamities. Ladies and gentlemen, as a region, ASEAN has responded very strongly to the crisis. We have adopted the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework. In short, we call it the ACRF. Now, this framework actually is helping us to cope with the issues of uh, COVID-19. And it covers into five broad strategies. It covers the segments on health systems. Second, it covers into human security. Third, it covers into intra-ASEAN market and broader economic integration. And fourth, it covers digital transformation will be interesting for all of you. And lastly, it also covers on sustainability. On the economic front, I must say that the ASEAN was very quick to commit to keep our markets open for trade and investments. In fact, the leaders in the ASEAN, they believe and they are deeply committed to open the economies for trade and investments. While many parts of the world, as you've seen, have been somewhat deglobalizing the last two to three years, creating barriers for cross-border flows. What we have seen this year and last year is that ASEAN member states have come together. In fact, in November 2020, okay, they came right when we were in the deep of COVID. The ASEAN members leaders, together with their trade partners, came together to finalize and sign the RCEP FTA agreement that is the largest free trade agreement in the world where the 10 member countries of ASEAN together with our key trading partners of China, Japan, South Korea, Australia and New Zealand have come together to make this FTA. Now this collective integration, this joint vision of the ASEAN member states to have better lives for their people and to remain connected and being relevant and globally competitive this has really driven them to collectively during this crisis to move forward decisively with their partners to sign the RCEP agreement. 
Now, this is really a testimony of the importance of what ASEAN puts on global trade and investment links. Second, on the economic front, ASEAN is also working very hard to ensure unimpeded flows of trade and supply chain connectivity, particularly for essential goods which are much needed during the pandemic period the last two years. In addition, the Hanoi Plan of Action on Strengthening ASEAN Economic Cooperation and Supply Chain Connectivity in response to the COVID pandemic, it had identified some key areas ensuring the smooth flow of goods during um, we actually came out with a memorandum of understanding, an MOU on the implementation of non-tariff measures, again signed by the ASEAN leaders, where we saw a very important list of 257 items consisting of mainly of medical goods, food, agri-products to be excluded from any imposition on NTMs or non-tariff barriers by the ASEAN member states during the pandemic. And I understand that as we speak, more items, about close to 107 items, were added in 2021. A most recent ASEAN summit that actually took place uh, last month, where the leaders met, they also welcomed the adoption of the ASEAN Travel Corridor Arrangement Framework. This is something I'm sure the business community is really looking forward to. As, as you know, business travel and the ability for our region to be able to travel efficiently is really on the top of the mind of every business out there. Now to move forward, we definitely may need to, need to consider using digital solutions or tools for smooth and efficient operationalization of the ATCAF within the region. The solution, of course, we are thinking should be reliable, cost-effective, easy to use, interoperable, and secure for travelers, for governments, for the airlines to be able to efficiently manage the flows and for the airports to allow um, the movement of people in a very efficient way. And in this regard, we are of the view that the ASEAN will all have to strengthen our partnership with the leading industry organizations such as AETA. And in particular, we really believe that we are of the view that the ASEAN Travel Corridor on the next level, we will have to continue engaging AETA and try to find ways where we can incorporate some of their solutions in supporting our own domestic uh, needs and requirements. Hopefully, this is going to pave the way for the region to be able to connect with one another and for business travel to come back again as we imagine. Obviously, it's not back to where it was prior to 2019, but in a way that we can start operating sufficiently well. Ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned earlier, digitalization and collaboration it can and will play a very important role in our drive to economic recovery. Now, to start with, digital transformation in ASEAN, it has progressed at a remarkable pace over the past decade. It's estimated now there is 463 million internet users in the region, making ASEAN region the fastest growing internet market in the world. Whilst automation, artificial intelligence adoption, they all are gaining very strong traction in the region. In fact, after crossing the US 100 billion mark in 2020, ASEAN's in internet economy is expected to reach US 300 billion by 2025. The COVID-19 pandemic definitely has been an accelerator for digital transformation in ASEAN. It definitely is one of those things that is positively come out of the COVID, it's changed the way we live, the way we work, the way we interact with each other. And digital technologies have definitely kept ASEAN as a vibrant economic community during the pandemic. And it will permeate all aspects of our lives in the post-pandemic reality that we are creating forward. And over the past few years, what we have seen has been a number of digitalization-related initiatives across the three pillars of the ASEAN community. A new initiative was recently launched to again further strengthen the region's strides towards digitalization. At their summit again in October, the ASEAN leaders, interestingly this year, they also issued a statement on advancing digital transformation in ASEAN, which again calls for the strengthening of digital integration and transformation in the region to enhance ASEAN's competitiveness by turning the current pandemic into an opportunity through digital transformation. The leaders also 
adopted the consolidated strategy for fourth industrial revolution for ASEAN. And this strategy is really more to guide the ASEAN community to progress towards digital transformation. It's our journey and it's our focus in the area of 4IR. The same summit that, uh, that took place also saw the ASEAN leaders welcome the endorsement of the Bandas Sri Bhagawan Roadmap. This roadmap, we call it the PSBR. It is really an ASEAN digital transformation agenda to accelerate ASEAN's economic recovery and digital econ economic integration. In addition to highlighting all of the new and existing initiatives, it's really crucial uh, in supporting ASEAN's ongoing digital integration through a phased prioritization approach from 2022 to 2025. Now, this roadmap is something I want all of you to pay attention to because for the very first time in this roadmap, we have also indicated their leaders have come together to commit to a commencement of a negotiation of an ASEAN-wide digital economic framework agreement and the start of negotiation before 2025. I believe that while the deadline is before 2025, that negotiation is probably going to start way before that. So watch the space. Now, these initiatives definitely are going to complement ASEAN's ongoing digitalization initiatives, such as the ASEAN Digital Master Plan 2025, the ASEAN Digital Integration Framework Action Plan 2025, the Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025. They are, I know they are mouthful, but all of these are very important initiatives that has been committed by each of the ASEAN member states, and they, they are all targeted towards assisting the region towards an inclusive, sustainable recovery, but also to help the region achieve its vision to transform itself into a leading digital community in the coming years. Ladies and gentlemen, in addition to the aforementioned digitalization initiatives, ASEAN, in furthering shaping our digital future, we are now riding the momentum of the High Performance Computing, HPC. We are devising a plan to define our own HPC capacities with a vision to establish a shared HPC infrastructure in ASEAN. Now, hopefully Huawei can see that this is a vision is materialized um, we want to build a regional HPC uh, capacities here and this is where we are hoping that one day Huawei will be able to concentrate and also build a centre of excellence in our part of the world, in ASEAN, in order to ensure that we do not stay behind from the other parts of the world. Now, against the backdrop of the increasing digitalization, for us, the HPC is really a very necessary tool to build a foundation for scientific, for industrial, for societal advancements, which will in return translate that into economic growth and the betterment of our people. Hence, a shared HPC infrastructure model would rely on collaboration between the national, regional supercomputers, as well as private um, um, entities like yourselves coming together, opening doorways to global uh, HPC resources and talent and more collaborations. In fact, last year, the HPC market generated revenues of 23.98 billion, of which the server market generated almost more than half, 11.85 billion. HPC really spurs the adoption of digital innovation across all industries fostering economic growth and competitiveness. From big data analytics to genomics, sophisticated HPC is poised to address the challenges through the high speed and the high bandwidth fiber optics. I think in this era where we are challenged with a global pandemic, the economic uh, fallout that's from it, the climate change complexities, we believe HPC is really going to be a platform to advance towards economic recovery and sustainability solutions. Now, applying the power of supercomputing combined with artificial intelligence and use of big data will definitely provide us unprecedented opportunities for recovery. As such, cross-regional collaborative effort hopefully will pave the way for ASEAN to digitally transform with HPC. 
ladies and gentlemen, on climate change and environment. I would like to recall that at the COP26, ASEAN issued a joint statement, the leaders issued a joint statement on climate change, which kind of underlined ASEAN's commitment to the Paris Agreement and to the call to all parties to enhance the ambition of their national determined contributions to advance a low carbon and climate resilient development. Acknowledging the critical role of financing to support low carbon recovery, ASEAN has also adopted the ASEAN Taxonomy on Sustainable Finance, which was developed to provide common standards for ASEAN members. Uh, it also states on uh, sustainable finance. It focuses on what sustainable finance should be. In fact, partnerships and collaborations with private sector, I feel, is another important area in driving inclusive and sustainable recovery in the region and beyond. Now, this is key in fostering innovation to stimulate science-driven solutions to address the current pandemic, including through better scientific understanding of the virus, the development of vaccines, diagnostics and treatments, and helping to develop systematic solutions to advance sustainable technologies. In that view, in mind, I really want to emphasize the very important importance of multi-stakeholder partnership and collaboration once again. One that cuts across the sectors and pillars of ASEAN cooperation involving the myriad of diverse stakeholders. Indeed, for us, ASEAN cannot work alone in this technologically fast-changing environment. We will need to pursue a very active engagement with our business partners, with the civil society, especially those representing even marginalised informal society and of course external partners now to ensure we all can come together, work together towards an economic recovery that's inclusive and sustainable one. Please allow me to close by emphasising that there's no better time for us to reset, to reunite and to rebuild. Whilst the pandemic has truly brought about unprecedented challenges to our societies, it has also given us an opportunity to reflect, to innovate, to reimagine how we can chart our future and to build a better tomorrow for our children. We should seize this opportunity to make our societal and economic recovery truly transformative by investing in solutions to the crisis that address social, environmental and of course economic transitions needed by our society and the planet. These endeavours will undoubtedly, it will require support from all stakeholders. Again, once again, I'd like to thank Huawei for giving me this opportunity to address all of you.